All right, cool. Are you recording? I am. And get this. Hey, guys. This is Creatures of the Night podcast, and I am Wendy. And I am Chris. Hello. Hello, Wendy. (laughs) I worked on that all day because I thought, you know, fair is fair. I should intro it every once in a while. Well, you confused me because you were pointing at me. So I was like, all right. So I took a deep breath, ready to go. And then all of a sudden, Wendy does it. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, I got to tell you this, Chris. I think... I need to go home to Tennessee soon for a visit and you might want to come with me because I don't know all the details, but I think my parents are getting pretty creeped out by something in their house. So they've told me about this before. They've lived there for a few years now. I think four years is how long they've been there. And it was maybe like a year after they moved in, they had their first experience. And it was a pretty impressive experience. I may have told you this before, but I know I haven't talked about it on the podcast. So my mom says that she woke up in the middle of the night slash early morning hours. And she saw a figure of a young girl around like eight or 12 years old. Okay. That was standing on the other side of the bed next to my dad watching him sleep. My mom says that she remembers feeling like really angry about it because she's like crazy protective. But after the girl looked up and saw my mom staring at her, she just faded away. So then my mom went back to sleep. (laughs) That's awesome. She scared that bitch. (laughs) Your mom's like, well, she's gone. Going back to bed. Took care of that problem. (laughs) Just like when your kids come in, right? Your kids come in in the middle of the night. You wake up, you see them, and then they go away. You're like, all right, cool. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Go away, child. (laughs) So after that, though, my dad and my mom, they started to see like things out of the corner of their eyes as they just kind of moved through the house, even like during the daytime. And they started hearing like strange noises here and there until recently. They didn't see the little girl, but they had another experience that was pretty extreme. My mom said that she woke from her sleep again and she saw a man standing in the doorway of their bedroom pointing a gun at them. Oh, God. But where I would, like, lose my shit, she says she remained calm because she could tell this was, like, a ghostly figure. Or she even thought it might be, like, something left over from, like, her dream state. Like, whatever she was thinking about while she was sleeping might have just kind of you know, still been in her vision. So she wasn't as sure that this was a true paranormal experience as she was when the little girl thing happened. But I think it's creeped them out enough, both of them, that they want to know what's going on. Well, first of all, I was going to tell you in the beginning, I don't really need a reason to go back to Tennessee. I want to go back and see, you know, our peeps. And, you know, your folks are our peeps. And your mom has always been wonderful. And your dad, too, because they love us and they love the paranormal. So, of course, now they're having paranormal experiences. Well, yes, let's get on that plane. (laughs) Let's go visit them. I know. Sometimes I think they're telling me about stuff in the, like, parent (laughs) supportive way of, like, I know you love this creepy stuff. So (laughs) I'll just tell you this is going on. But this last thing she told told me was pretty fucking crazy and Uh, I thought I don't know were you dreaming about this before you woke up and she said no and I said well how would it be there then I don't get how it would have come from your dreams if that wasn't something you were dreaming of I know you forget your dreams pretty quickly I do but I don't know am I jumping the gun here is she having night terrors No, I've never known my mom to have night terrors, though my niece does. So I don't know if it could be a family thing. Interesting. Yeah, but I don't know what's going on. And like every time I talk to my parents, they're asking me about like what app could they download or is there something that they could buy online to help them communicate with whatever's in their house? And I get asked this question a lot. I don't know if people ask you this question. People don't seem to believe me when I tell them that they could speak to whatever they're experiencing like they would speak to anyone else, just normal questions, normal tone of voice, and they could use their phone's camera to record it and then just play back and see if something's there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the only reason that we use fancy equipment is because we're recording for like hours nonstop and then we have to edit it. You know, that's the only reason we use audio recorders and shit like that. I mean, you could use your phone and try to get something on there. 
100%. I have a recorder on my phone. As a matter of fact, there's an owl that hoots out in the woods and I love the way it sounds. And I thought, how cool would that be to like wake up to the owl? So I use my phone to record it so that I can use that as my alarm tone, you know, wake up to the actual hoot hoot owl, right? That is so cute. I actually heard an owl last night when I went outside. I let all the pets out, including Winter, because now she's a regular <laughs> going out with the dogs and felt good outside later in the night, you know, so I immediately spin around looking for the moon and then you hear the owl in the background too cool yeah, perfect kind of cool until the cat went around to the other side of the house and I had no shoes on and I'm like you can't wander off like that in the dark <laughs> God. that's the first thing I thought of and you already spoke it I was like I know you had shoes on so it's a problem and you say and I had no shoes on no <laughs> I know, I'm a dummy. But yeah, I don't know what's going on at their house and everything, but they keep asking me about it. So I think that, you know, at some point I'm going to have to make it out there and help them investigate. And I just wanted to bring that up to you and throw that out there as yet another paranormal trip that I desire for us to take that I'm sure my bank account can't handle. <laughs> I want to go back to Tennessee, too. As a matter of fact, I've been talking to my dad. And the weirdest thing is he told me that he's been having some really weird dreams. So much like you, like I was wondering, you know, if my dad was doing that with me just to keep the conversation rolling. He's just like, all right, Chris likes weird stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> but I love my Tennessee family. I miss them. I miss them all. But for your parents, I wonder, have they tried putting any crystals in their room and, you know, saging, try to get rid of it or... Honestly, I don't know. Maybe they are doing something. They're not telling me, though. I think they would. I think they just learned to live with it. I think they maybe slightly feel silly doing it themselves. Or maybe they feel like they need an expert and they consider their daughter to be an expert. Nice. <laughs> I know. We've got business cards, so. <laughs> <laughs> or they're just trying to appease me. Like I said, they're just, I know she likes weird stuff. I'll talk to her about weird stuff. Sometimes I do think that people embrace the fact that we are so open about those things about your dreams meaning something and these experiences that you can't explain they're coming to us because they know we're the one person in their life that isn't going to laugh this off right and might tell them a little bit more about it I'm no expert but I'll ride that ride with you we can go and explore it together for sure I especially enjoy it when I get that from other family members because I feel more like, see, I know that we belong to each other. This is my family, right? Because yeah. you're coming to me with this weird stuff. You know I'm all about it. To me, it's more about that togetherness. And I've had family members that I haven't talked to in years bring stuff to me. And I'm just like, oh, my God, you were here this whole time and you had all these experiences. Stop it. I love it. Well, they were probably like nervous to tell anyone else. Anybody. Yeah. And then they're just like, I know where I can take this. I've been saving yeah. this. I can't wait to tell someone. Man, no kidding. Bring your paranormal therapy sessions to Chris and Wendy. Come <laughs> we on. We are ready to listen. Love it. Yeah, for sure. But <laughs> budget-wise, we are stuck <laughs> in our little hobble homes here on the other side of the country from each other and from our family. So I guess all we can do is really take these virtual paranormal experiences together. So if you'd like, we can do one of those tonight. Oh, yeah, sure. Fine. That's cool. We yeah, can do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. I wrote this whole fucking story out for you. <laughs> well, okay, then. It'd be hilarious if you said, no, actually, I'm kind of busy. No, I'm busy tonight. Let's <laughs> reschedule. <laughs> <laughs> so my last story was on the very haunted Fort Riley in Kansas. And within that story, I talked about the ghostly happenings in what they call the Custard House, which wasn't really Custard's house, though he was posted there for a time. While I was researching that story, this other Custard's house kept showing up in the search results. So I thought to myself, why not? <laughs> I'll yeah. just make that my next podcast story. And it's not oh. exactly a part two, as you'll see. It leads us down a much different path. Nor is it probably the last of the quote unquote custard's houses out there. I mean, he was a military man. He was stationed several places. I think most people know who Custard is. I mean, we've all at least seen Night at the Museum, I'm sure. If you haven't, it's a cute ass movie. You should totally it check it out. Ben Stiller. It's one of his greats. But if not, here's a quick history, just in case. 
so that you know the man behind the myth. General Armstrong Custard was born in New Rumley, Ohio, on December 5th, 1839. He came from a large family and spent a lot of his youth in Michigan with his older sister and her husband. Mm. Despite his humble background, a Michigan congressman secured Custard a place at the Military Academy at West Point. Custard was said to be an intelligent and talented man, but a lazy student who was always getting into trouble. <laughs> Nice. Like him. This is my style. Mm, This motherfucker (laughs) managed to rack up 726 demerits in just four (laughs) years, and he graduated last in his class. He's having too much fun. He was a jokester, for sure. Shit. Despite his unimpressive academic record, the U.S. government desperately needed officers to serve in the newly begun Civil War. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant and based in Washington, D.C., Custard got his first taste of war mere weeks after his graduation at the First Battle of Bull Run in July 1861, where he gained the attention of General George McClellan. He soon joined McClellan's staff and fought during the Pennsylvania Campaign. Custard earned a reputation for bravery as he was always seen leading the charge. He also became known as a publicity whore. (laughs) He... (laughs) took every opportunity to get himself in front of the cameras and newspaper men documenting the war. In 1862, he returned to Michigan for a time and he met up with a childhood friend, Miss Elizabeth Libby Bacon. The two fell in love and despite her father's misgivings about Custard, because he's a fucking jokester, Uh the couple married anyways that December. I bet he was a lot of fun. And I love that her last name was Bacon. I and know. <laughs> this is Custard. <laughs> so awesome. Their wedding invitations were the best. I bet. They put the male or the female first. So it's like Custard Bacon or it's Bacon Custard. I like the idea of Bacon Custard. Man, me too. I mean, Bacon goes with anything anyways. Yeah. I mean, I told you about my Bacon milkshakes. Right. Yeah. So unlike most military wives of the time, Libby happily accompanied Custard to his postings, and they both wrote each other constantly when separated. The couple had no children, so instead they poured their combined efforts into growing Custard's fame. They held regular parties in their homes, and they told their stories to journalists back east. In the summer of 1863, the 23-year-old Custard was promoted to Brigadier General of Volunteers and took command of the Michigan Cavalry Brigade. But despite their successes in many Civil War battles, his brigade lost more than 250 men, the highest of any Union Cavalry unit. Custard's unit would continue to rack up disproportional numbers of casualties throughout the war. Mm. Custard led daring cavalry raids in the final days of the war, which was covered in national newspapers, and led him to his final promotion during the war to Major General of Volunteers. Custard served in the Southwest immediately after the war, where he clashed with his troops. He briefly considered leaving the army to pursue business opportunities or to run for political office, you know, since he loved the limelight so much. But when a new 7th Cavalry Regiment was raised to pursue American aims in the West, Custard assumed command as lieutenant colonel. All right. Up the ranks. Right. Custard and Libby arrived in Kansas in the fall of 1866, and Custard participated in a campaign against the Sioux and Cheyenne the following spring. When a group of American soldiers were massacred by the Native Americans, some of Custard's men accused him of abandoning his troops. Mm -hmm. Shortly afterwards, he was court-martialed for leaving his command to visit Libby when he feared she was sick during a cholera outbreak. Oh, hmm, that sounds familiar. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sentenced to one year's leave without pay, the Custards returned to Michigan. But by the fall of 1868, Custard was back, with Phil Sheraton having argued for his early return to fight in the Indian Wars. In November of 1868, Custard led a raid on a Cheyenne camp along the Washita River in what is now Oklahoma. 
This was the army's first significant victory in the region and brought Custard more fame. As they continued to push west, Fort Abraham Lincoln was established in 1872 to protect the city of Bismarck, North Dakota, and the new railroad construction from Native American attacks. A beautiful grand house was built for the Custards. Since then, the original house did burn down, but it was rebuilt in the exact same spot. Like, even the cellar is original to the home that was there when Custard lived there. And it was rebuilt to match the exact plans of the first house. Fort Abraham Lincoln was located way out in the country, far from civilization. So Lieutenant Colonel George Custard and Libby Custard felt the need for a slice of normalcy for themselves and for the officers and their wives who were stationed there. Plus Custard's two brothers, Tom and Boston. Never thought of that as a name. Kind of cool. Love it. Yeah. As well as his nephew were also stationed in Fort Abraham Lincoln. So they needed a home big enough for the whole family to visit. The Custard House is a two-story house with a wide front porch, a parlor, and a study that he would use for meetings, a game room for general socializing. Also, it was large enough for, or is large enough for servant quarters and guest rooms. God, I want that much space. I <laughs> know. In North <laughs> Dakota. <laughs> it could all mm. be yours. If the price is right. <laughs> In the middle of nowhere. No. Mm. Libby Custard was such a detail-oriented person, some would say a control freak, that mm. she apparently had written down the inventory of all their furniture that she had purchased for the home. Home. Sounds like a nut job. <laughs> <laughs> Again, she doesn't have rugrats to chase, so she's just right. like, I got to think of things to do. There's no TV, so she can't watch fucking Tiger King, you know? So oh. <laughs> <laughs> she'd get nothing done if she, she had Netflix. Out. Man, but take an inventory of everything in the house. That's severe boredom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. She Poor girl. did this in such a manner that many of the furniture pieces that are on display in various rooms, even today, were reconstructed according to Libby's descriptive accounts. Kind of like Lizzie Borden's bed and breakfast. And then how yes. it's like perfectly matched up to all those photos. It well, in does. this case, it just went off of what Libby was telling them that she had ordered for each room of her house Man, and they didn't have an ikea back in the day so how was she that descriptive she couldn't go to like the manual and be like h89 m <laughs> page 39 order it i think <laughs> even like with wayfair.com you can pick like room by room you know and how you want to decorate and everything they didn't have this so she was just fucking drawing plans and making lists all on her own okay i can get down with that that's cool. That's time consuming. Plus you get to add your own creative aspects to it when you're creating the plans. I thought you were just like, she walks into the room and she's like, couch, flower pattern. <laughs> she probably put a little more flair to it than that. <laughs> All right. Well, I like it better than what I was envisioning originally. Yeah. Back in a time when women didn't have jobs because they really weren't allowed to. I mean, she probably would have been very successful as an architect wow, yeah. or designer, I guess. Nice. That's cool. The home is also decorated with actual artifacts that belong to the custards. Like descendants of theirs have donated items. Aw. Like what? Like skulls? And no. Shit? What the? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Libby was ordering those. No, like family photos or like actual curtains or something. Just little trinkets throughout the house. Gross. Okay. <laughs> Here I'm saying gross to curtains, but not to skulls. <laughs> No, I mean, they don't collect the dust like a curtain would. I know. God. Yeah. All the mites in there and stuff. Yes. Thank yes. you. Gross. But like their stay at Fort Riley, their time at Fort Abraham Lincoln was short-lived as well. In 1875, gold was discovered in the Black Hills of South Dakota. The U.S. Army ignored previous treaty agreements made with the Native Americans that they would not travel through these lands, and they invaded the region anyways. Oh, you're saying they just did whatever the fuck they wanted to? What? No! So, these actions broke the terms of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, which had recognized the Black Hills as Siouxland. 
The U.S. tried at first to buy the lands from the Sioux, but as they valued the land as holy land, they rejected the offer. Did that stop the government there? Fuck no. <laughs> like you said, they just did what they wanted, and then they made a government order that the Native Americans needed to push on to other yeah. reservations in what is now Oklahoma. By January of the following year, our risk being seen as hostiles. Note, I said January. I don't know exactly when they gave them this order, but that means they would have been traveling through the harsh-ass fucking winters of the Dakotas to get down to Oklahoma. That's awful. That is fucking awful. Yeah. I wonder why they were seen as, you know, possibly being hostile. I'm sorry. But that would have pissed me the fuck off, too. I mean... (laughs) Well, any sense of defiance is what they translated as, you're being hostile. And then they came in with their forces. And I'm not an expert on this, but I assume because... Most tribes lived independently of each other, Mm -hmm. that their groups, they weren't that large, not like a military force coming at you. Right. So among those who resisted the government's bullshit was Lakota chief and holy man, Sitting Bull, and Sioux warrior, Crazy Horse. Mm -hmm. That was also the name of a band with Neil Young. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I've warned you before that I'm a history nerd, (laughs) and it doesn't feel right sharing this story and giving you Custard's history and not Sitting Bulls or Crazy Horse. These dudes were warriors for their people, and they deserve to have their story shared. So let's jump back a bit, and I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. Sitting Bull was born in 1831 near Grand River, Dakota Territory in what is now South Dakota. He was the son of Returns Again, a renowned Sioux warrior who named his son Jumping Badger at birth. That was Sitting Bull's name at first. Oh, that's cute. The young boy killed his first buffalo at age 10, and by 14, he joined his father and uncle in raids of Crow Camps. After the raid, his father renamed him Sitting Bull for his bravery. Sitting Bull soon joined the Strong Heart Warrior Society and the Silent Eaters, a group that ensured the welfare of the tribe. They didn't eat people. I think it was something different in their meaning. Thank you for clearing that up. Yes. Okay. <laughs> he led the expansion of Sioux hunting grounds into westward territories previously inhabited by the Crow, Shoshone, among others. Sitting Bull's first battle with the U.S. Army was in June of 1863 when they came after the Santee Sioux in retaliation for the Minnesota Uprising, an event that was sparked when federal agents withheld food from the Sioux living on reservations reservations along the Minnesota River. Mm. Over 300 Sioux were arrested, but later, President Abraham Lincoln reduced the sentence of all but 39 of the accused. Sitting Bull faced the might of the U.S. military again at the Battle of Kildare Mountain in July of 1864, when the U.S. forces under General Alfred Gully surrounded a Native American trading village, eventually forcing the Sioux to retreat. These types of face-offs convince Sitting Bull to never make a deal with the U.S. government. And he would never sign a treaty that would force his people onto a reservation. Though his resolve was not shared by all. In 1868, Red Cloud, chief of the Aguala Teton, Dakota Sioux, signed the Fort Laramie Treaty along with 24 other tribal leaders and representatives of the U.S. government. This treaty created the Great Sioux Reservation, which included lands in South Dakota, Wyoming, and Nebraska. Sitting Bull's anti-treaty stance, though not shared by many chiefs, it did gain some followers. And Mm. around 1869, he was made supreme leader of the independent bands of Lakota Sioux, the first person to ever hold such a title. Members of the Arapapo and Cheyenne tribes soon joined him. Crazy Horse. Now, he was born in the Black Hills of South Dakota in 1841. I can't wait to find out how he got his name. Well, get this. It's not that exciting. Maybe (laughs) I should have dug into it a bit more. He is the son of the Aguala Sioux Shaman, also named Crazy Horse. So he's just a junior. He's just a junior. (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) 
Oh, I like it. Crazy Horse Jr. All right. Crazy Horse Jr. was not a traditionalist with regard to his tribal customs, shrugging off many of their traditions and rituals that the Sioux practice. Wow. In 1854, Crazy Horse rode off into the prairies on a vision quest all by himself. He's just, this is what I've got to do for me. Well, he is Crazy Horse, (laughs) so you got to hand it to him. He's a bit wild, I will say that, from what (laughs) I read about him. He fasted for two days and then had a vision of an unadorned horseman who directed him to present himself in the same way with no more than one feather and never a war bonnet. He was told to toss dust over his horse before entering battle and to place a stone behind his ear, something that he did until the day he died. He must have had some tight ears. I can't place a stone back. Wait, does it have to stay back there or just you put it back there if it falls? So what? He did the thing. (laughs) (laughs) I am thinking he's that hardcore that it had to stay and that he made uh-huh. it stay. But for us, we would be like, well, we tried. Well, we tried. He must have had some gum. I mean, there's no way I could get a rock to stick behind my ears, especially if you're riding on a horse. No. A dusty horse. I can't even keep my glasses on my fucking face. I mean, I, know. Like, I just pushed mine up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep a rock back there. I don't know how he was doing it, but he was doing it. I'm going to find this out. <laughs> Crazy Horse was, like I said, from what I read about him, he was a wild spirit that just kind of made his own path. And he fought hard for his people, taking the lead in many battles against the U.S. forces and other tribes when needed. But when the Treaty of Fort Laramie happened, Crazy Horse did not trust this arrangement at all. And he soon joined Sitting Bull. That was smart. These two amazing leaders strongly resisted the efforts of the U.S. government to confine their people to Indian reservations. They believed that if these were the last days for them to live as they desired, they would do so as free people. That's awesome. Yeah. So many began to follow them, and they soon had a group of Lakota, Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho tribe members with them. They gathered in a camp along the Little Bighorn River in what is now Montana, which they called the Greasy Grass. They united there to discuss plans to take back their tribal lands. It was here that Sitting Bull participated in a Sundance ceremony where he famously danced for 36 hours straight, making 50 sacrificial cuts on each arm before falling into a trance. Don't yeah. really know why that had to be a part of it. I was up for the dancing, not the other thing. He had to lose a lot of blood, I guess, to fall into that trance. So in order to do that, lots of cuts. That's dedication right there. Yeah, you got to wonder, like, where were the cuts made? And were they little, like, paper cuts? Right. Oh, God, that's a lot of pain over and over. <laughs> but Jeez. not a lot of blood loss, so it's safer. That's for true. Sure. That's true. <laughs> but all the pain, that's <laughs> suffering. <laughs> when he awoke, he revealed that he had a vision of U.S. soldiers falling like grasshoppers from the sky, which he interpreted as an omen that the army would soon be defeated. When the U.S. Army gained news of this large native camp, Custard and his 7th Cavalry was dispatched to confront them. On the morning of June 25, 1876, Custard drew near the camp, unaware of the true number of Native Americans there and against the advice of his scouts, among those scouts, one of them being a gentleman by the name of Bloody Knife. I wonder how he got his name. (laughs) He was a warrior of his tribe that I will butcher the name of because sadly I've not heard of them before. It's the Arikara. That's my best effort right there. Custer decided to press ahead rather than wait for reinforcements. See, he had feared that the Native Americans would escape for one, but he also thought that they had already spotted him. So he divided his troops into three battalions, which would attack the camp in different directions. Mm. One battalion was led by Major Marcus Reno, who harbored resentment against Custard from that 1867 incident, which he led his troops into a massacre. Oh. Yet 10 years later, here they are together at the Battle of Little Bighorn. It's said that Reno ordered his men to move to safety at the first sign of attack, 
which of course happened. Yeah. And then there was Captain Frederick Benteen. He was tasked with the other battalion to take them off a distance and he was to prevent any Sioux from retreating, which they didn't do. And neither of these two commanders tried very hard to rush to Custard's aid, which Custard had went along the ridge and was trying to come down the long way, which he never made it. Oh. This all led to later speculation that they played a role in his death, that basically they hated his guts and they were like, yeah, "Yeah, we're not putting our lives at risk for all this. Yeah, for this jokester. They didn't agree with his plan either. Splitting up like that wasn't a good idea. He wasn't listening to people about how many Native Americans were actually down there. And he thought that he had this in the bag, no matter what. Wow. Despite Custard's desperate attempt to regroup his men many times during this battle, he was quickly overwhelmed. Hmm. Among the Native Americans, word quickly spread about the impending attack. The older Sitting Bull, which he was only in his 40s, but to them, that's older. He rallied the warriors, but then he saw to the safety of the women and children within the village. While Crazy Horse set off with a large force to meet the attackers head on. Okay. Crazy Horse led as many as a thousand warriors to flank Custard's forces and help seal the general's disastrous defeat and death at Battle of Little Bighorn, also known as Custard's Last Stand. Gotcha. I've heard of that one. Right? Yeah. Custard and some 200 men in his battalion were attacked, and within an hour, Custard and all his soldiers were dead. The bodies of Custard and his men, which included his two brothers who fought along with him, were not discovered for two days afterwards. Ooh. The sole survivors were an unnamed Native American scout and a cavalry horse named Comanche, who they actually took back to Fort Abraham Lincoln, and he was nursed back to health, and he was never used in a campaign again. He was more like, you know, just a symbol of their loss from this battle, and he's like a Budweiser horse, you know, after that point. That poor horse saw so much. He's also in a museum now, you know. Like his body? Yeah. They stuffed him? I have a picture if you want, but it's oh a horse God. in a glass case. It's him. It's taxidermied, whatever way they do that. Yeah. Oh. I didn't expect that, but it is Oops. out there. Also, another horse that made it was, or at least this is a legend among Bloody Knife's people, he was actually noted as saying at the beginning of all of this when Custard, you know, ordered the charge, he said, I will not see the sun go down beyond the mountains tonight. I am going home tonight, not the way that we came, but in spirit, home to my people. And his horse apparently survived the attack as well and traveled 500 miles back to Bloody Knife's village, which is called Like a Fish Hook. I'm sure you're supposed to say that quicker or better. That is near Garrison, North Dakota. The horse went all the way back there? He went all the way back. I've seen stories where dogs do that all the time. Cats, too. They just, they find their way home. Yeah. And so when this horse did that, the men and women of this village, they saw this as like an embodiment of all the warriors and soldiers returning from battle and it's a legend that they tell about today within their people Mm -hmm. the battle of little bighorn marked the most decisive native american victory and the worst u.s army defeat in the long plains indian war the demise of custard and his men outraged many white americans and newspapers painted native americans as wild and bloodthirsty Custer's Mm. death made him a martyr, with newspaper stories, articles, books, advertisements, and even Hollywood movies glorifying his life and career. Chief among those promoting his fame was his loving wife, Libby Custard, Mm -hmm. who spent her widowhood writing a series of bestsellers about their life, continuing to cultivate his legend for more than 50 years until her own death in 1933. 
I mean, it seems like to me, like she was his biggest promoter the whole time. She's like, well, I'm either fucking inventorying the house or I'm going to market you as some big deal. So, I mean, come on. It also fed her bank account, I'm sure. So, I mean, it was a means of survival for her with promoting his career ahead of time because that benefited her as well and even afterwards. And that's not, you know, to justify her actions at all. No. She just didn't have anything else to do. I mean, maybe she did believe in his cause, which makes her an asshole. And then also maybe she was just looking for a means of survival because, you know, how many widows really remarried after that? Especially when you're Custard's widow, I mean. Yeah, I don't know. Did she remarry? No, she didn't. No, she's an asshole. (laughs) (laughs) She's just a racist. I mean... (laughs) But as many people began to see what shitheads the U.S. government had been and still are to the Native American peoples, attitudes about Custard shifted. You know, at one point he was seen as a hero and now in more present day, he's an asshole. Mm hmm. I mean, he seemed like an asshole to begin with, with all that cutting up in school and shit. Oh, and I skipped over the parts about how he liked to dress and everything to make sure he was seen. You know, his big brim hats and his scarves. That wasn't typical for other generals. He did that, he said, in a way so that he could be seen apart from everybody else. That Uh they knew where their leader was. But, I mean, a lot of people just saw it as being flashy. Yeah, he was flamboyant. Yeah. Right. Very full of himself. Yeah, it sounds like it. To me, it does. And I didn't even know all of this about him. But just from hearing the story, it does kind of seem like he was full of himself. Yeah, same here. So back in 1876, the U.S. government was able to use this tragic battle as an excuse to increase its efforts to subdue the tribes. Mm. Within five years, almost all Sioux and Cheyenne would be confined to reservations. In oh. May of 1877, Sitting Bull led his people to safety in Canada. But with food and resources scarce, Sitting Bull surrendered to the U.S. Army on July 20th, 1881 in exchange for immunity for his people. Well, I mean, it seems like a wise decision. Otherwise, they were facing the Wendigo. <laughs> he didn't have a lot of choices. <laughs> I'm with him. I like it. So he was a prisoner of war in South Dakota's Fort Randall for two years before being moved to Standing Rock Reservation. Sitting Bull was occasionally permitted to travel, and it was on one of his trips outside of the reservation that he struck up a friendship with sharpshooter Annie Oakley. No shit! Yeah, yeah. Well, he joined... Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild Wild West show because of Hell his yeah. relationship with her. All right. Sitting Bull rode in the show's opening act. He signed autographs and he even met President Grover Cleveland. Though sometimes he was mocked and booed off stage. Mm. He left the show when he was 54 years old, never to return. He went back to Standing Rock Reservation, which soon became the center of controversy when the ghost dance movement started gaining traction ghost dance is that what i do up in my kitchen when i'm making dinner (laughs) probably Uh, (laughs) so followers believed that deceased tribe members would raise from the dead along with killed buffalo while all white people would disappear worried that the influential sitting bull would join the movement and incite the rebellion native american police their own police on the reservation advanced his cabin to arrest him Mm. on december 15th 1890 police woke the sleeping sitting bull in his bed around 6 a.m when he refused to go quietly because he did nothing wrong and others stood in protest for him a young man in the crowd shot a member of the police and in retaliation the police shot sitting bull what he died instantly from the gunshot and he was buried at fort yakes military cemetery in north dakota by the army in 1953 family members exhumed what they believed to be sitting bull's grave and reburied the bones they found near mobridge south dakota overlooking the missouri river Mm. so crazy horse traveled to big butte to harass white miners in the black hills that motherfucker wasn't giving up (laughs) why the sioux faced continued hostility from the u.s 
Sensing the tribe's struggle for survival, Colonel Nielsen A. Miles tried to strike a deal with Crazy Horse, promising to help the Sioux and treat them fairly. Crazy Horse eventually agreed to save his people from starving. However, the negotiations did not go well, surprise, surprise, and there was a lot of fighting back and forth, which led to Crazy Horse being arrested and later dying during an altercation while in prison. Oh no, he got shanked. He did. Hey, did you know that? No, I just, altercation in prison and that's what I think of. That's exactly what it was too. And it was because he was refusing to go somewhere at the time or whatever. You know, there's no reason really for him to be arrested. They were just accusing him of being aggressive. God, that sucks. His body was taken away by Sue and buried at an unknown location near the creek called Wounded Knee. Interesting. I know, because then there was a big battle there, too, as well, which neither Sitting Bull or Crazy Horse were involved in. Mm. Crazy Horse was remembered for his courage, leadership, and his spirit in the face of near-impossible odds. His legacy is celebrated in the Crazy Horse Memorial, an uncompleted, I did not know about this, it is an uncompleted monumental sculpture located in the Black Hills not far from Mount Rushmore. It was started in 1948, but has yet to be completed. This guy, he does projects like I do projects. <laughs> <laughs> He's, I'm halfway there. Don't rush me. I'll get to it. Come on. Takes time. <laughs> so what is done is open to the public and I think are solely funded on the donations that they receive by visitors that go there. Aww. So back at Fort Abraham Lincoln, after word of the battle reached the widows and their families... They wrote books, got money. <laughs> well, first, <laughs> they joined together at the Custard's house, and they took prayer with the chaplain. After that, they all moved back home, and new cavalry troops and officers were sent to replace the ones that had been killed in the line of duty. But change was soon to come. In 1883, Fort Abraham Lincoln, 7th Cavalry Unit, was sent to defend Fort Meade as the railroad was completed, lessening considerably Fort Abraham Lincoln importance to the area. The post was decommissioned and left to the elements in 1891. Wow. After a new Fort Abraham Lincoln was built on the other side of the river, just oh. a year later, settlers and townspeople dismantled the entire fort for all the nails and the wood, not letting those precious things go to waste. You know, I love these kind of scavengers. Yeah. They did the same thing in Fort Erie. Yeah. Man, you know, I could sure use them nails. <laughs> <laughs> and they just go and start peeling them out. It's me every time I see a piece of pallet wood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is crazy. So it was declared a state park for years, but it wasn't until 1932 during the Great Depression that the buildings began to be rebuilt. Today you can visit the park and tours are offered of the Custard House. And since its opening, ghostly reports have been made in the Custard House and the surrounding buildings. Since it's been rebuilt? Nobody was really there beforehand. But now that it's staffed and they're doing tours uh, and people are okay. coming yeah. to visit, then everybody started seeing these things. Okay, that makes sense. This led the park to call on local paranormal groups to come and investigate. In August of 2009, Dakota paranormal investigators caught some hard evidence in the Custard House, pointing to a male and a female spirit residing there. Many think this is Lieutenant Colonel George Custard and his wife, Libby Custard. Well, are they taking a bunch of selfies? Is that how they know it's them? Because <laughs> these two sound like they're full of themselves. So. <laughs> no, I really don't. Don't know where they get this from and they also get voices that they feel like are connected to other types of spirits as well but i think these are the two dominant spirits there okay during a walkthrough with the staff member one of the investigators asked if there were any items of the house that were original to the family like i said there are little knickknacks here and there that actually belong to the custards yeah. so this staff member shows them to the kitchen and is showing them one of libby's plates and then at this time, they received an EVP that said, no pictures. Oh, then it's not her. <laughs> 
No, but seriously, that is so funny. Please don't let that happen to me. I do not want to be tied to my fucking dishes. I hate doing <laughs> the dishes. You know when it used to be a big thing that you got married and you got your own china? Right. I don't think that's a thing anymore, as it probably should have never been. Terrible idea. Cash is the way to go. <laughs> let me pick out my own damn china. You know, I did get china as a wedding gift from my husband's side of the family, but it was hand-me-down duck plates with bonnets. Oh, yeah. Mm. Goose. Excuse me. They were geese with bonnets. I get giving newlyweds dishes, but like you can uh-huh. make them some plain fucking plates. White is fine. Right. Nobody doesn't need plates. But please don't let me be tied to my dishes when I die. Not your goose bonnet dishes, oh at least. Oh, my God. No. I do still have them. I didn't get rid of them because those bowls were pretty good. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> well, then there you go. You say it's not going to happen, and then I hear oh, that in God. your voice. This woman mysterious chris duncan is tied to this <laughs> goose bowl <laughs> you're gonna do a spirit box session around the goose bowl and it's gonna be me just screaming no because <laughs> you ate that you're trapped there i love that <laughs> i gotta see this bowl when i come visit <laughs> I'll, I'll show it to you we can break them no uh... they are good bowls but they're ugly <laughs> Uh, So, also, while standing in the Custard's house parlor, an investigator was talking with Scott. He's one of the four Abraham Lincoln staff. They were talking about the Battle of Little Bighorn, and they captured an EVP that said, More of the men have been dying. It was in a male voice. I realize that that statement doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I guess because it talks about a lot of men dying, it connects. Yeah, it's like somebody was there having a conversation with like one of the generals or colonels. Like yeah. they're there in time. It's a, you know, replaying of that moment. And he's saying more of the men have been dying. That's, oh, and it's in the parlor. That sucks. Yeah, where they would have held like meetings and everything. And, you know, yeah. Reno and Ben Teen's groups, they did make it back. Yeah. Later investigators were on the main floor talking with Matt. He's another staff member. I guess these are all rangers probably too. And while they were making conversation just about general things, they got a woman's voice that said, love y'all very much. And and then a little (laughs) later, it said the name Scott. Someone's flirting. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Love y'all very much, but mostly Scott. (laughs) Yeah, but also later in the investigation, they get, I love you, Matt, and I want you. This fucking ghost is horny for these park rangers. That is so Funny. Okay. So yeah, definitely when we go and investigate this place that we have to have Matt and Scott with us because they are the trigger candy of the show. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> these ghosts are loving them. That is fucking insane. Yeah, they are digging these dudes. And all of these EVPs you can find on the Parks YouTube channel. This is uh-huh. what they were so proud of. I bet they were. Now, on Dakota Paranormal's YouTube channel, you'll find a few more EVPs, though they lack description. So the where's, like what room and the why's, what were they talking about? Those are not there. So they're just random EVPs to us because we don't know what they sparked from. But they are uh- very clear, and that's why I wanted to mention them. One okay. says, I can see you. And it's a female or a childlike voice. It's high pitched like that. Mm. Then there's another one that says, it's not him. (laughs) Yeah, she's like, where's Scott or Matt? (laughs) No, this isn't a male voice. So I don't really know what they're talking about. But like I said, it's close to class A in my opinion. Wow. This group also went back in April of 2010 and they caught something kind of interesting on camera. Though the quality is total crap. I did say 2010. Right. But I wanted to share it with you at least, though I don't know if this will be something that we'll share on social media, just so we can kind of discuss it. And I sent you a text about that. Okay. So you watch the video. And let me tell you what you're looking for. Okay. Because it's an orb. And I know we're not exact Ah, fans of that. I did see those. But it's one particular ball of light that you Mm -hmm. see move in frame from the doorway and slowly down the little steps. And as it does this, it drops lower and lower, kind of like someone walking downstairs. I thought it rather interesting because it matched the pattern of someone actually moving down steps to me. 
And like I said, the quality's not great, so it's grainy, and that's why we probably won't share it. But you can see it, I think. Yeah, I can link it. The thing is, I swear it seemed like it had gotten darker at some point, but maybe it's just my eyes focusing on the orb. That would make sense, because that's the movement. I could see that, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, it is something weird that comes out of nowhere and seems to come down the steps. Okay. Yeah. So it's not just this erratic, floating little light or anything like that. It has this strange movement. So I think it gives it some validation. Sure. Now in 2013 and 2014, Midwest Spirit Paranormal Group, they investigated the Custer House multiple times. Most of their evidence comes from the questionable spirit box. But their most relevant responses they got was, one time they got, I'm stuck. And this was after they asked, why do you reside here? Well, that's a good explanation. Then they got the names Howard and then later Eric when they had asked the question, who's here? And they had asked it multiple times. You know, they just kept asking who's here. Another (laughs) time they got the name Isaac, which is actually the name of one of the investigators. And that came randomly, not as they were asking who's here. So it was almost like they were trying to get his attention. Yeah, yeah. In that same session, they also got, I still want to speak to you. And then later, speak. So I think they were probably aggravated with Isaac that he wasn't hearing that they were coming through or something. How weird. However, during a different investigation, I guess the spirits didn't feel much like company because the only spirit box response they got was leave, which was in a male voice. And it came while they were in Custard's bedroom. They're like, look, I'm trying to give you answers. Who do you want? Okay, we got Howard here. We got Eric. Uh, Who do you want? (laughs) And then they're like, okay, hey, Isaac. Hey, you over there. Why don't you answer some of our questions? (laughs) I still want to talk to you. (laughs) And they're demanding them. And then I don't know like what happens there, but it sounds like they get frustrated, right? And they're just like, y'all peace out. Fuck y'all. Get out of here. (laughs) (laughs) It's really interesting, though, when you play it in that, like... In that order? Yeah. 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 You kind of see the picture of what was happening. The ghost was like, y'all... They're getting frustrated that you're not hearing exactly what they want to tell you. Yeah. While walking the outside of the house, an investigator asked... I think it was Isaac. I'm sure he asked this to provoke the spirits, but he asked... What do you think of the Indians? And a voice that sounds like a male says, got rid of them. Well, I added that Southern flair. I don't know that it came through the spirit box like that. But <laughs> It was a Southern male? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. A few moments later, the same investigator asks, what do you think of Custard's decision at the battlefield? And this time over the spirit box, they got what sounded like multiple voices. At mm. first it said, smart. And then a few moments later, it says stupid. And then (laughs) followed by that, it says smart again, as if they're debating, you know? Yeah, or there's three different ghosts or spirits there, and they're like, yeah, smart. The other one's like, stupid. And then someone else comes in and is like, no, it's smart. Yeah. (laughs) Huh. More recently, Fort Lincoln has hosted local radio shows multiple times for like a mini evening investigation. In September and October of 2017, Hot 97.5 toured the Custard House as well as a few other locations on the grounds with Matt, that little hottie that is a part of the fort staff. (laughs) Though no activity actually ever happened on these little mini investigations, Matt did share the paranormal reports the Custard House and the fort itself is famous for. Matt said they often heard EVPs of a little girl on the first floor of the Custard House. Though they had no children. So where'd she come from? Where did she come from? Hmm. They also have gotten EVPs that they believe is connected to Miss Mary, who was a servant of the Custards. And they get them mostly in the kitchen. So that plate thing... That might not be Libby. That could be Miss Mary. Oh, that makes a little bit more sense. Someone who would have been more tied to doing those sort of chores and things like that. Yeah. And not out for the attention. Uh-huh. Yep, exactly. And in the second floor game room, Matt said they seen shadow figures, which they actually started seeing these even before the construction was complete on the house. Like there were no floors on the second level, but they were seeing shadow figures up there. What? That is weird. They just appeared? Yeah. Like, they're just, what's that? Floating in the sky. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. So if there was no building there before, where were these shadow people 
before floating in the sky in midair right. Right, exactly. <laughs> so do we need to be looking up when we're out paranormal investigating I like think so <laughs> that is so weird they've also seen a woman in this same room this game room but they see her in the window usually when they're outside of the building and nobody okay. else is supposed to be in the house it's locked up and staff and visitors have reported seeing a woman staring out one of those windows yeah because before she was like well uh someone put this wall here but i used to just be able to float out <laughs> into space <laughs> What the hell happened to my life? You're so annoyed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Matt also says the fort's barracks are haunted with the sounds of footsteps. And in the years of the fort's operation, soldiers actually died in these barracks because oh. they froze to death what? due to like horrible winters. It's North Dakota and a lack of sufficient heat. They had like one fucking fireplace at the end of the barrack room only on one side. So if you got stuck on the far side with your measly little blanket. Hopefully you were the hairier type. You know, you need that extra. That sucks, man. You don't want our soldiers to have to freeze to fucking death. They're already having to go out there and face all kinds of things. And then they're fucking freezing to death just because you can't put a fireplace on both ends. <laughs> right. That's stupid. Libby should have built this. No kidding. Right? Oh, seriously, that's the most absurd. No, no, no. There was lots of absurd shit that you told me already in the story. So right, that's not right, the right, most right. absurd. Yeah, it's, but... not, it's pretty minor. Yeah. On top of that story, there's also reports that soldiers also hung themselves in the fort stables. Uh. Matt didn't really give a reason on why, but um, we kind of just discussed it, you know. So, I mean, maybe they felt they had no options. They couldn't stand one more fucking freezing night in those barracks. I don't know. But the stables are haunted as well. Man, why put the horses through that? They do report hearing like sounds of, you know, galloping, I guess you would say, horse yeah. noises in there as well. And They're this is terrified. where Comanche, you know, ran back to. Wow. And the tragedy of the Little Bighorn battle, of course, did not only echo its pain back at Fort Abraham Lincoln and the Custard House. It, of course, left an imprint on the battlefield itself, which is a national monument near Crow Agency today. This mm. is southeast Montana, about an hour east of Billings. Okay. Guests can tour the area and listen to a free cell phone audio tour. I love audio tours, by the way. I love free. Yes, <laughs> both great. <laughs> or you can simply just walk through and take some time for quiet reflection. Mm. Of course, since a lot of anguish and death took place here, it comes to no surprise that the battlefield is rumored to also be haunted. Visitors and employees have reported hearing strange noises, and some have even seen full-on apparitions of soldiers after dark. Some of the most harrowing ghost stories come from the Stone House, which was built in 1894 for the cemetery caretaker. Because everybody that perished wow. there was buried kind of in that spot. And then later they actually added to it, putting a national cemetery there. Okay. Many of the reports involve lights being turned on and off when no one is inside this Stone House. Oh, sounds like a jokester. Mm. <laughs> One of the early government workers who stayed there spoke of seeing a terrible apparition, which was only a torso of a soldier. No head, no legs, just a floating torso. That is pretty scary. That is pretty scary. But he wasn't saying anything or doing anything. It's just like torso. So the guy got totally freaked out. How's he going to say anything? Because <laughs> there's no head either. It's no. just the It's what? just the floating torso. <laughs> Look, I don't think that that's scary. I'd have to stop and I'd be pulling out my camera phone. I'd be like, you guys have got to see this shit. Imagine a shirt just floating in and you're like, that's what I'm saying. What am I missing here? I would have to see if I could put my coat around just to see if it would hang on. <laughs> you feel like you're safe because it doesn't have a head or right. legs. So it is safe to approach and see what, but it's still in the arms. So no, it's a, just a torso. They didn't just necessarily torso. say arms. It's just this part. So there's no arms, nothing that can wield anything at you. It's just. Yeah. So you <laughs> go up with your arm around to take a selfie. That type of thing. I know. I would talk yeah. to me like that. Mardell Plainfeather, a ranger at the park, says she saw what she believes are the ghosts of two warriors on horseback looking down from the bluffs above where she stood. She said their forms were definite. 
She could see their feathers, their shield, their hair, their horses' heads. She even watched as one warrior lifted up from his horse to kind of look down at her and get a better look. Plainfield, as well as other staff, have also heard strange noises in the night, like groans coming from the museum and the fields. I mean, all these buildings are placed right where the battle was as well. Yeah, right. And some have seen an apparition of a soldier they believe to be a part of Custard 7th Cavalry, given what he's wearing. Okay. There's even been a Taurus. This is fucking crazy. There was a Taurus from New Orleans, who temporarily disappeared for several hours, then suddenly reappeared, and he claimed that he had been transported back to the day of the battle. The fuck? (laughs) What? That happened also somewhat on the USS Texas, that battleship that I did. Uh, That is one heck of an amazing audible tour that you can get for free. (laughs) And... (laughs) Ah, shit. I am totally doing that. You know what? That really could have been it because I <laughs> I can tell you my Alcatraz one. I did a submarine one. I mean, I love audible tours that are very interactive and they tell the story where you, all of a sudden you're like, you're hearing the noises of the dishes clank while you're in the kitchen and stuff. And you think you're there. This guy could have been tripping and just enjoying that shit. <laughs> he just went and sat down in a dark room, had his eyes closed and was like, he was there. Just way <laughs> into it. Because we're going to believe where I just was let me tell you the whole story (laughs) they're like that sounds so familiar yeah i think we heard that too actually (laughs) of course none of this news is new the park has been haunted for years back in the 1920s the wife of a park superintendent reported feeling a clammy hand touch her while she yeah. was down in the base well she was visiting the vault which i could only assume is in a basement I just made that up, though. I added that. I assume that's where vaults are. (laughs) Sure. I wonder if that clammy hand once belonged to the torso. (laughs) Wait, maybe it does have hands. They just didn't say that, though. So I don't know Mm. if it's armless or if it's got arms. (laughs) It could be threatening with arms, but you you could probably get away from it quickly. It just depends. Just the torso, and he's all like, you know, floating his arms around or whatever. You can still just be like, that's just cool. <laughs> right, right, right. Because he can't see you. So Yeah. All you got to do is like poke him gently on one shoulder and right. he goes in that direction. Yeah. And then you're on the other side taking right. your selfie. <laughs> there are also files. They have files and files of all these paranormal claims. Oh, that's cool. There are files showing that one-time guide, James Thompson, reported that while viewing bloodstained clothes from soldiers from the battle that they keep down in those vaults, that he said he felt like a tingling feeling on his scalp. Why do they keep the blood-stained clothing in the vaults down below? I assume that they are something that eventually moved to display. They would have been on bodies. So did somebody go around and be like, you know, those clothes are pretty sweet. And they just like take the clothes. They're like, what are we going to do about these bloods? I mean, like, how are they now in possession of just the clothes? Okay. And then there's some naked. (laughs) I see your point here. Okay. So let me tell you something that I left out. They buried the soldiers right where they fell. And then they came around and they put markers up for a lot of those right where they fell. But then at some point, you know, to reorganize things, they came along and they dug up all those bodies and then they put them in a mass grave. So I imagine when they did that, they're nothing but bones. And they said, well, there's really no reason for these clothes to be in there. Wow. I can see why they're irritated now. Yeah. Okay. So you buried us where we laid. Fine, fine, fine. Then you came and dug us up. Then you reburied us without our clothes in a mass grave. Well, you're just bones by then. Do you really need the clothes? I don't know. I really don't know where I fall on that one. Yeah. And a lot of people have different customs when it comes to their burials and their beliefs. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they were just kind of thrown into a pile, you could see why they're disturbed. Yeah. So that's how they got the clothes. I think. I don't have those facts. 
Okay. But that's interesting. It would make sense. Well, it does answer my question, even if it's not the correct answer. (laughs) I love to just make up answers here. I'll take it. Sold. It seems logical. Mm -hmm. So this guy looking at the bloody clothes, when he felt the tingling, he also felt this surge of sheer terror go through him. And he believed Mm. he was having a psychic echo of a soldier. This is something that was also mentioned by Plain Feather, that they feel a lot of the sounds that they hear and experiences they have are psychic echoes. That's what they like to call them. Okay. But these are just visions of something that happened in the past, I would assume? Okay. Yeah, that's how I would interpret it. Okay. Another park ranger, Al Jacobson, said he and his wife, Florence, they lived in an apartment in the old stone house. So like downstairs is kind of common area and upstairs they've got some apartments for rangers and whatever that are working there. Okay. They often would hear footsteps within their apartment and they would also hear them as they were downstairs in the common area and they knew nobody was up in their apartment. Wow. One time while they were in their apartment, they saw the doorknob twist. They open the door and nobody's there. Okay. Well, that is like one of my favorite things, seeing the doorknob twist. I don't know if I'd be the person to open up the door and look on the other side. (laughs) (laughs) But you have to because you're like, wait, was somebody trying to come in? What was going on? I just sit behind it with a knife the rest of the day waiting. (laughs) I'm going to prepare myself. We know from experience that there's a freeze. (laughs) Our life could be in danger. Could be a real person type situation. Yeah. Jacobs also said a volunteer ranger once told him that he saw a man walk through the wall in the basement of the museum. Okay. Yes, because they rebuilt all of this. So it wasn't walled up like that before, I would assume. So the man walking through is, again, probably doing something out of past life, just out of memory. Also, like I said, don't know this for sure, but I bet these vaults are in the basement of the mm-hmm. museum. Oh, yeah. Where else I was... are you going to store things? So there are items that they're connected to are down there. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah, it's either or. I would love to see somebody walk through the wall. As a child, I saw something walk through a bed, and that was Dunsies for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> wow. The second you see them do something impossible, you're like, yeah, that shit's not right. I'm <laughs> praying to Check my almighty out. Jesus to protect <laughs> me from this, and I'm hiding under these covers. Wow. And then walked it was gone. Walked through your bed. It walked through my sister's bed, actually. <laughs> probably tickled her toes she didn't even know but i watched the whole you thing watched it. and i said it's coming for me <laughs> stop right there sir well, that's enough <laughs> you were under the covers, so you were totally safe my protective shield yeah right so actually none of these rangers or volunteers or anybody that's really been a guest to the battlefield feel that the spirits there are bad they might get eerie feelings but they don't get bad scary feelings All right. Most believe that they are protective spirits, actually. They're soldiers. Right. And there are tons of posts and comments out there by visitors who speak of the peace that they feel when they're in the area. It's somber, but it's peaceful. Mm. Like I said, both of these locations, Fort Abraham Lincoln and the Little Bighorn Battlefield Memorial, are state and national parks. So if you happen to be lucky enough to travel there... We are the podcast that encourages paranormal investigation, of course. But always remember to be respectful, guys. So if you or anyone you know has a story from this location, please share it with us and we'll share it here on the podcast. You can email us at creaturesofthenightparanormal at gmail.com and you can reach out to us through social media, which is C-O-T-N underscore paranormal. Also C-O-T-N paranormal on Facebook and Twitter. Then... We ask that you please, please, please support the show by rating and reviewing on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts, as well as visiting our shop, The Spirit Emporium, which is on Etsy, and it's also on our website, CreaturesOfTheNightParanormal.com. We've got badass spiritual products, great for an investigation like this, and then we also have cool podcast tees and gear. And that's it. That's all I got for you. Your history class is dismissed.
dismissed. <laughs> wow. This episode plus the most other recent one that you just did. And I just put them together and I just cannot wait to go investigate a fort. Like that's all <laughs> I want to do. There's just so much action. It just seems like they're so alive and it makes sense because there is so much history as you pointed out. There's just so much shit that has gone down there. There's every kind of emotion that you can expect, you know, and there's buildings being erected where ghosts have probably just been wandering around forever. You just had to look up in the sky and <laughs> apparently there they were. I mean, this is so impressive. And I love the story. And I like the whole time I'm thinking of forts that are nearby. And I'm like, where can I go? Where can I go? But this is awesome. I know we don't have enough forts around here in Arizona, for sure. Not that I'm aware of not in my area. So I'm really, really jealous of things like this. I love the history lesson. And, you know, there's so much emotion that goes into a location like that. It's got to leave some kind of imprint. So as a paranormal investigator, I'm really intrigued by the locations as well. It's not just the soldiers, which, of course, they went through some shit, too. But their families involved. And then the battlefield. I mean, this was not just a battlefield, necessarily. The village was right there, too. All these people had to go through this experience of people invading them and coming in and just attacking them randomly you know that's awful it's another kind of world that i've never experienced and i never will because i never joined any kind of military service but just to think to put your life on the line just to care for your country just to say that i did this that i served and then these people end up dying because of bad living conditions or because of war it's insane And so you do have these kind of stories. There's just so much activity. It just sounds like to me, like these are the locations where you just can't go wrong. Well, you imagine the turbulence that people had to go through. Yeah. It's sad for both sides and what they were experiencing and the imprint that it left on that area. So, I mean, I've never been there. I definitely want to go there. I told you I'm a history nerd. I love all that shit. So I think it's definitely something to check out. And then, like I said, on the paranormal side, you know, you kind of slip out your recorder and be like, is anybody here? Anybody want to walk through some walls? Don't get too close. (laughs) Unless you're a torso, then we take selfies. (laughs) Yes, I can handle that. I think that's awesome. Man, I love that. I do have one other question for you that's not so much paranormal, but Hot 97.5. Do you know what music they're playing on that station? (laughs) I don't know, but I don't think it was country. So I bet you it's like (laughs) the pop, you know? (laughs) Nice. I left this out because you know how much I hate them, but at least back in 2017 and years before that, and probably still now, Fort Abraham Lincoln does a haunted house every year. Oh, they do? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I hear you. When places go in, they do the haunted up. But hey, hang on a second. Fort Knox in Maine does the same situation. And that's another haunted location. Yes. I don't care if it's on Halloween or if it's on the 4th of July. If you're going (laughs) to open it up for me to come in, guarantee that I'm going to come in with my diaper bag full of paranormal equipment. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we have seen it time and time again. True haunted locations will still do a Halloween spooky haunted haunted house for you. Waverly Hills did it, the Winchester house. I can go on and on. So many locations do it because some people are just looking for that short thrill. Not everybody wants to rent out an entire house, you know, for a paranormal investigation, which, you know, a lot of the times it's sitting around licking, licking, sitting around. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tasty EMF detector. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sitting around listening to your stupid spirit box your echo box or whatever right. waiting for this meter Nothing's this happened. rim pod to buzz off and it takes five <laughs> hours oh, when you, you could spend 20 minutes going through this haunted house and walk mm-hmm. away thrilled <laughs> yes ma'am i love them i mean and that's the thing what people don't really recognize is that tv is entertainment they gotta fucking edit that shit down so that you're only seeing the entertaining parts of it the stuff where they're actually getting you know the spirits connection and that doesn't happen all the time on a real investigation you are like Wendy said we're sitting around forever like well okay let's talk so what did you do last week Wendy (laughs) it's very much like this podcast (laughs) yeah (laughs) and then all of a sudden the door opens or you hear footsteps somewhere or you see a torso floating around but it takes all fucking day for that to happen 
So yeah, I don't hate on these people or think that they're not true paranormal locations because they open up haunted houses. But there you go, guys. Maybe check it out in October. They might still be doing that. I didn't see anything recent, but with everything that's going on, they might not be planning. Who knows? I don't know. I have seen a lot of things that are generally planned for September and beyond seem to be putting out there that they're still going forward with those plans. I've so, seen some of that too. Yeah, definitely here where we're going to yeah. burn that fucking virus. Please do. <laughs> with burn it. hell fire. <laughs> we call summer. <laughs> burn it away. And I hope it burns away everywhere because it's shit. I hate it. <laughs> I'll package some of the heat in a bottle for you. Please and send it to me. Thank you. <laughs> no, but seriously, that's all that I got. I totally dug the history from both sides. I love that stuff. I'm such a fucking nerd. And then to hear the paranormal happenings that they've got going on in these locations, you could totally understand why the feelings that were there, you know, the emotions that were involved, the excitement. So yeah, I just thought it was a cool story. I wanted to share it with you. Well, thanks. I'm glad that you did because I thought it was an interesting story. I, too, enjoy the paranormal aspects. I did not know that about you. (laughs) I'm coming around to this paranormal way of thinking. I'm sort of starting to like it, so... No, but it was a good story. I'm glad that you did that. Thank you, Wendy. Well, you're welcome then. And (laughs) that's all we got for you. So. All right. Bye. Bye.